Mr. Vice President, in the, there is news of more, more disclosures of corporations and uh, different countries trying to gain influence with the Clintons through the Clinton Foundation. You've been in Washington a long time. Couldn't they have seen this coming when you have somebody who's a Secretary of State and a foundation that you'd have these conflicts of interest? Well, I, I, I think they've acknowledged that, that, that they could have done it better. Um, the good news, thank God, is there's no evidence of anything that's been illegal. But it's, it's uh, um, you know, like, for example, they've now said that uh, when she wins, he's getting off the board. I hope when she wins. If she wins, uh, he'll get off the board of the foundation. You just, you just have to be, uh, um, I, I, I think if they could go back and do it again, they'd probably make some changes. But Should they just shut it down if she wins and becomes president? Well, it does too much good to shut it down. I mean, it really. Uh, I, I've not been, the, you know, the number one defender of the Clinton Foundation, but it's done too much good. So shifting it to other control of others beyond the Clintons, I think would be, a, you know, I think it's going to be necessary when she becomes, if she becomes president. Because you know what happens when people pretend they have a lot of access oh, and influence. I do. I do. I don't know how many people have come up to me over my career and said, you know, so-and-so told me. I said, well, I don't know so-and-so. But then again, I have a reputation of being on the other end of this, so I, uh, I, uh, I'm not. Uh, was, uh, we were trying to raise money for me for ra running for president back in uh, 2008, and Senator Kaufman, who wasn't senator then, my best friend, and pa, set up this big fundraiser in New York. And one guy in New York raised his hand. And he said, "Well, Senator, did you ever talk to the regular people?" And I said, do you think I'd be talking to you if you didn't have money? Of course I talk to the regular people. I'm not coming to you for advice. I'm not very good at it. Let me ask you, Hillary Clinton, in a speech she gave to one of these uh, banks that's been uh, disclosed as a part of this WikiLeaks hack, said that in making progress in politics, you need to have a public persona and a private view because the sausage making is just too ugly for the public to see. You've made a lot of deals. You've done a lot of work in the Senate and as vice president. Do you agree with that idea? Well, I think, I think what she's trying to explain is true in the sense that you can't go out. When I sit down and I meet at the president's request with the head of state or I'm negotiating up on the hill on something, uh, on, you know, trying to avoid uh, reneging on the national debt, I can't leave there and say, well, Senator so-and-so said to me, I know you're right, Joe. My guys are crazy, you know, wherever. You can't do that. So when you ask me uh, what's going on, I said, well, we're working on it. We're, we're getting close. Uh, I think we can. But so, so you can't. The, 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 the truth is there's nothing unethical about agreeing that you do not talk about the details of what you're trying to work out until the end. And sometimes, by the way, John, uh, you know, I'll say to somebody who I know wants to come the way that we want them to come and say, look, I'll say, John, tell me what your political constraints are, okay? And if you want to blame me for this, I'll set it up so you can blame me. You got to figure out how to, if you agree on a way to arrive at a good solution, you got to be willing to be able to, uh, um, you know, not reveal every detail of how you got there. I assume that's what she's talking about. Trust and honesty has been a big part of this campaign. Voters don't trust either of the two candidates. And I went back and looked and I was looking at promises to keep. And you talk about your grandfather Finnegan and his lesson, which was public servants are obliged to level with everybody, whether or not they'll like what he, the public servant, has to say. Do you think that applies to Hillary Clinton's dealing with this private server that she set up? Well, I think it's a combination of a couple things. One, I don't think she understood the gravity of setting it up. She thought it was, you know, this was okay to do. And then when uh, this, this woman has been so battered <laughs> over the last 30 years, I think then when faced with this is a problem, I think instead of just cutting it and, and dealing with it immediately, there's always a inclination to overthink it. Um, but, but I really do believe my grandfather said. I, I think people reward you being straightforward. And, um, uh, you know, my state of Delaware was a, uh, not a, it was a red state, not a blue state when I got out there. And I'd say things and people would come up and say, okay, well, at least I know where the kid stands. Um, I still think it's the best policy. But when you have been on the other end of a concerted effort, justified or not justified, 
to undermine your credibility, I think you probably are in a different place in terms of how you, your instinct has to respond. If she's in that other place with those instincts, does she need somebody, if she were to be president, to push against those instincts to keep what your grandfather? Yeah, no, I, no, I, I, I actually do think she does, and I think she knows she does, and I think she, I think she's also knows that when she's elected, she's going to have to be prepared to be more open as president as to uh, what her feelings are about things. But you know, there's kind of a double standard, John. You know. I, I get all this credit for being authentic and, you know, and now even Biden gaffes are now, you know, Biden tells the truth kind of thing. Um, but, um, so, but, but I'm, I'm a guy. I go out and if I start talking about my bow and I get filled up, my son who died, they say, well, he's a really, he's just a good, decent father, honorable man. If she were to do that, you'd have a chorus of, she's playing the woman card here, she's crying, a little bit like, like, like Michelle, anytime Michelle Obama said something strong, well, she's an angry black woman. There's a, a, a sector of, of the electorate that, that, and I think that that has a tendency, at least in over 30 some years with Hillary, to, to cause her to close rather than open. When people talk about your candor, what they say is you, uh, you know, you say something true maybe ahead of time, yeah. maybe before it's all been worked yeah. out, and, and, uh, and that's worked well for you politically. I think what I hear from voters about her is they say even when she's saying something that may be right, what they hear from her sounds like she's not being straight with them. And that doesn't well, look, seem like a gender thing. No, but, but Hillary said herself, she said, look, I'm not that good a candidate. Um, she said, I'm not, I think she said, I'm not Bill or, or Barack. Um, and uh, it, a, a, a lot of it has to do with personal style. And um, I do think that um, it is, uh, it is, she is uh, more measured and she makes fewer mistakes than I make or most people I know. Um, but uh, I just think it's more, it doesn't go to her integrity or honesty, it goes to her style. You send emails? I don't. I, let, me, let me back up. Occasionally, I'll get an email from a family member, but I don't have my staff send me emails. If they do, they text me something. And, but I, uh, I, I'm sure I have some emails, but the answer is no. Are you happy these days that you don't? <laughs> I'm very happy that I don't have an awful lot of emails. But who knows? The way the Russians hack, they may have hacked into anything I have. I don't know. I want to ask you about uh, now the Republican nominee uh, on that question of Russia. Donald Trump says, how do you know it's the Russians who hacked into the DNC or, or into WikiLeaks? How do you know? I mean, is think, it think about what that says to the rest of the world. Here, the intelligence community of the United States government, the most, the most potent military in the world with the most significant intelligence capability in the world, says flatly, we know it was out of Russia and we know it was Putin, or we know it was the Russians. And a candidate for president already is fawning over Putin says, well, how do they know? What, is, what, is that, what does that do to the confidence of all our allies that here you got a, the guy of the, head of the grand old party, and it is a grand old party, saying, well, you know, 17 American intelligence agencies confirmed this was done, but I don't think they know. I don't think they know. What does that say? It's a little bit like the president going out and saying, you know, I, uh, they tell me we got a good military, but I don't think we have much capacity. I, 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 I don't believe our military when they say they can assemble X number of whatever. It's, it's bizarre. Is it just politics or do you think there's something more? I don't know whether he just doesn't know. I, I know I get criticized for saying this. He just may not be informed enough to know what he's saying. I, it's just, some of it is so out of the box, John, so far out of the box. It's hard to believe that um, he could be so devoid of the facts. So it's either deliberate attempt to undermine or it is totally uninformed. But if, if we hear 17 uh, uh, intelligence agencies, if we read that in the press, how do we know? I mean, how does he know as a candidate? Or is he being briefed? He's being briefed. 
<laughs> he's being briefed. He's saying, intelligence guys are coming in. Yeah, so this isn't, he's just not no, reading no, no, this no, on the internet. He's not on the internet. I mean, and you had the head of the intelligence community, the director, the, the uh, you know, Mr. Clapper come out and say, confirm in front of all of you, this is what we have determined. Let me ask about Mosul, coalition forces yeah. moving to Mosul. Um, Donald Trump says, what a bunch of amateurs. I will put my thought process against these people any time. He, what he's talking about is why say you're going into Mosul? Why a telegraph it? We have been making it clear that we're going to go into Mosul as a coalition for the better part of the last two years because we're putting together the rationale for a coalition to move in and take away the caliphate. That's the same reason why we just announced that the Secretary of Defense said we're going to go to Raqqa, which is the other element of the caliphate. It's to do three things. One, make it clear to our friends and allies and the Arabs who are not part of, which is the vast majority, overwhelming majority, are not part of ISIL, we're not leaving you. Hang on. We're going to come. And to two, to give what we've observed is, in some cases we said we're coming, they abandon ship. They don't stay and fight. So there's a lot of reasons for it. But the idea <laughs> that Donald Trump, and then he said at the debate, he's convinced that the reason they're moving on Mosul now is to make Hillary Clinton look tough. Either he is absolutely, well, can, I mean, can you believe somebody would say that? It's like Eisenhower saying we're going to Normandy. And they say, well, that's done to help the re-election of the President of the United States of America. Come on, man. This guy is, this guy's not fit to be the Commander in Chief. You said you'd like to take him behind the gym the <laughs> other day. What happened to they go low, we, we go high? Well, no, what I was doing is he went real low. He, look, I, uh, I used to consider myself a pretty good athlete. What I really resent is the fact that they're trying to pawn off on every high school, college, professional athlete that this is locker room talk. It is not. Didn't happen in any locker room in high school or college I played in. I don't believe it happens. It is sexual assault. And I've spent my whole career trying to deal with changing the culture about how women are treated in America. And the point I was trying to make is this doesn't happen. This does not happen in locker rooms. This is not the way people talk. It's, a, it's, a, it's an insult to every athlete out there. So now he's come back at you and said, Mr. Tough Guy, do you regret well, getting look, back in? No, no, I don't, I don't regret it. Look, here's the deal. I was very explicit. I said, were I in high school? But that I were. That's a long, long time ago. But the truth is, John, that um, if I were sitting in a locker room and one of my teammates talked that way and my sister and her girlfriends and my girlfriend were outside, the idea that I would not confront that person, I'm going all over campuses, John, talking about it's on us. Because I found out when I did a virtual town meeting about sexual assault on campuses, I asked, the, it was tens of thousands of young men and women on, on the virtual town meeting. I said, here's the email address. Tell me what you think I should do. You know what they said? Spontaneously, get men involved. So I'm, I'm getting drawing crowds of two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 students every campus I go on. And I'm saying, take the pledge. If you see it, speak up. If you can't have time to speak up, if, if there's no, no time for help, intervene. Stop it. Stop it. Question about Obamacare. Yeah. 25% premium increases on those who buy insurance through the federal exchanges, yeah. ameliorated by subsidies. But some insurers are leaving the program. Is it in peril if a, the next president doesn't get some legislation to fix it? No, but I appreciate, as usual, the way you ask the question. Of all the people who have insurance, 85% don't get their insurance through the insurance plan, the, the, this exchange. Of the people, and by the way, for those people, they've had the lowest increase in the cost of health care any time in the last 50 years. So that 25 percent doesn't apply to 85 percent of the population. Of those that it does apply to, as you said, the vast majority will get an increased subsidy for the increase in the premium. But there are things we have to do, and the President was clear about it. One is we should be in a position where we are providing a greater subsidy for young people to get into the marketplace 
that can't afford to get in because when they're in, what that does is bring in a whole group of healthy people into the system instead of what's caused this increase in premiums, which is very sick people signed up and got in. But There's if, other things we have to do as if well. If those fixes aren't made, though, the trend line is not, if things stay as they are, no legislation to fix those the problems you've identified, then then it seems in peril. Well, no, I don't think it's in peril. It's not working as well as well, well as it should because here's what happens. You still have no one can be denied uh, uh, health care for pre-existing condition in or out of the system. You still have children being able to stay on their parents' health care until they're age 26. You still have women not, having to be, not being able to be charged more than men. There's a whole range of things that still justify it, but it's not as good as it should be. It would not imperil it, causing it to be not able to function. And one other thing, if 19 state governors just allocated, which they're able to do by the stroke of a pen, say we will, the federal government's going to pick up all the Medicaid cost here, that would significantly reduce the pressure as well. Where is this on the priority list for the new president? It seems like. I think it's going to be very high on Hillary's, on, uh, on well, assuming it's Hillary, uh, on her priority list. It has to be. I think it has to be. I think it's important. Let me ask about judges, Supreme Court judges. Ted Cruz said there's been a situation in America where it doesn't have to be nine judges. Look, John, um, essentially what they're implying was that for they'll hold up the appointment of a vacancy in the Supreme Court for not only just a year and a half, for another eight years or another four years. This is spreading the dysfunction of the Congress to the court. And I really mean this sincerely. It's one of the reasons why Democrats and Republicans should hope there is a Democratic Senate to prevent that kind of, of obstructionism from occurring. If there's a Democratic Senate, should they have the threshold for Supreme Court nominees be a majority vote and not uh, 60 no, votes? No, I think, I, think, I think they should. But I think if there's, if there's a majority Democrats, it takes enormous pressure off of Republicans who know better. When this happened, I called seven of my, and I'm going to say something outrageous, I have a lot of friends, I mean, anytime time there's a crisis, you know, I get sent up in the hill. And I don't mind because I really respect the place. I really respect, and you have the old thing of the, the tail wagging the dog up there. I called seven of my colleagues, Republicans. Here's what they said, Joe, I know you're right. I know you're right, but if I break, They'll come into my race of Koch brothers or somebody with another two, five, ten million dollars. Joe, I can't afford to do this now. Now, you might say, well, they should have the courage to do it. But when you have a majority Senate and they know there's going to be a hearing, know there's going to be a vote, then, in fact, I think you'll see a number of people. They say that recently or with respect to the Garland nomination? With respect to Garland. Okay. Um, what does it mean to be an Obama whisperer? <laughs> well, you know, um, I had the advantage, and I think it's fair to say, of uh, knowing an awful lot of the people we brought into the cabinet longer and better than, uh, than, than Barack, uh, excuse me, than the president. Um, and although they had enormous respect for the president, they weren't as used to dealing with him as I was. So I'd have, and he is not as, uh, um, uh, he, uh, he doesn't wear his, uh, um, his feelings on his sleeve all the time. And so people would say, and you wear them on both sleeves. I'm unfortunately, it's it's a draw. The, the the president kids. He said, you know, Joe and I, we make up for each other's shortcomings. He makes up for mine. I have, he has very few. So uh, what it means is, I have his confidence. Um, I am a close friend of his. Uh, he knows he can trust me one thousand percent. And so people can come to me and say, well, well, what do you think? Do you think I should, how, how should I approach making my case to him? That kind of thing. But that doesn't happen much anymore. In the very beginning, that was, you know, was the Obama whisperer, you know, but it's exaggerated. The number of lunches you will have, weekly lunches with the president, is dwindling. Yeah. Do well, you, we're still going to hang out a little bit. You're going to hang out after, after it's over. Yeah, for real. You might just have longer lunches. You'll have yeah, we may have longer lunches, yeah. Do you talk about the fact that you're, you know, the exits? Yeah, we do. We, 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 we talk a lot about what each of us are going to do and what we might be able to do together. The bottom line is both of us feel that there are the things that motivated us to, to get into politics are still the things that shape our lives and our interests and make us happy. And so you're going to see the president deeply involved in a lot of the things he's continued to be involved in. And I'm, I'm not going away. I'm, 
you know, everything from this issue of violence against women to income inequality to the cancer moonshot. I'm going to devote the rest of my life to this. What's it going to feel? I mean, since well, you were I 29. Know. I don't know. Um, I must tell you, I, um, I know there's an awful lot that I will have access to do, but I have never, uh, from the time I've actually been 26, every morning I've gotten up, I've, you know, somebody hands me a card that uh, has my schedule on it, and, you know, and I know what I'm about to do, I know what I want to work on, and so I, it's, it's going to be an adjustment. I, I honestly don't, uh, I've enjoyed, I have been so proud of being involved in public service that um, um, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to do it other than the structure of, you know, American political system. A lot of times people ask you, it's been about a year since you decided not to run for president. You've been asked a thousand times if you regret not deciding not to run. Was there ever a moment in the last year where you said, boy, I'm glad I didn't run? Well, I, I guess, yes, in that um, uh, some of the, uh, the vitriol that exists today in a, in, and some, some of the stuff that the other team's doing, I, I just am glad my grandkids, you know, I sit and say, God, I, I mean, how do you respond to a guy on stage when he, I mean, I, I'm just happy, let me put it another way. A woman who runs my office has a daughter that's in, I think, sixth grade. I called her on Columbus Day, which was a holiday, to check my schedule the next day. And I said, you watch the debate? And her comment was, my daughter had a girlfriend over from class. They were supposed to watch the debate. The first few minutes, I had to turn it off. I didn't want my daughter seeing this debate. The stuff of, uh, you know, Anyway, so, yeah, there's sometimes I'm, but look, I, um, uh, I, think, uh, I think I made the right decision um, for my family and for me, and I think Hillary's going to be a hell of a good president. In 1972, when you announced you were running for the Senate, this is what you said. God you said, almighty, you, you did your homework. We're divided people. We have too often allowed our differences to prevail among us. We have too often allowed ambitious men to play off those differences for political gain. We have too often retreated behind our differences when no one really tried to lead us beyond them. It feels like you could give that speech today. I could, but I tried my best to lead us beyond them, and I think for a significant period of our time, we did. Um, you know, history runs in cycles. Uh, you know, I say to young people out there, they said, well, why would I get involved now with the dysfunction in government? We were more divided substantively when I ran and made that speech than today. The Vietnam War, the women's movement, the civil rights movement was uh, still not finished. The whole environmental movement. I mean, it divided families. I mean, it divided friends, those things. People didn't speak to one another over them. And yet, my generation did, we did get involved. We did make a difference. We did change things in the 70s and the 80s. But it is, it, it, it moves, and the abuse of power is always always just right there and reached for by, by people who, uh, who shouldn't be in power. And we need people to speak up to it, speak out against it. And that's what I have tried to do my whole career. I don't think, I don't make myself out to be a hero, but I don't think you'll find anybody in public life I dealt with that I've ever not uh, tried to bridge the differences with, not be honest with. On your last day of office, what are you going to do? What I'm going to do is, um, uh, go home and uh, begin to figure out what I do for the rest of my life. And I think it's going to, I hope to be able to do the same things I'm doing now out of office. Mr. Vice President. Hopefully. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Appreciate it.